Remembering an icon, Canadian filmmaker Norman Jewison passes away. Director Adam McGoyan joins us to talk about his life and legacy. Meeting at the intersection tonight, Brandon Gomez, Mary Walsh, Gortan Singh, and Larissa Waller to discuss the Liberals' cabinet retreat, new federal polling numbers, and the head-to-head -head in New Hampshire tomorrow. And on tonight's Spotlight, former Supreme Court Justice Rosalia Bella discusses the rise of anti-Semitism in Canada and growing political divisions. From the Canadian Broadcasting Centre, this is Canada Tonight with Travis Danrath. And hello to you on this Monday night. Here is what else we are tracking tonight. The showdown in New Hampshire. Our Katie Simpson will tee up Donald Trump and Nikki Haley facing off in tomorrow's primary. Plus, the former president's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, joins me live in 15 minutes. But we begin tonight with the death of a Canadian trailblazer. Filmmaker Norman Jewison has died. Our Magda Gabrselassi is here with more on Norman Jewison's life and his legacy. Good evening to you. Good evening, Travis. Well, according to his publicist, Jewison uh, died on Saturday peacefully. Now, this is a big hit for the film world. He was celebrated for everything from doing comedies to tackling serious social issues in his films. Now, Jewison was nominated. Uh, his films were nominated. His, uh, the actors in his films were nominated and won dozens of times. Times. And you would know his work, some of the films he's best known for, In the Heat of the Night, Riddler on the Roof, and Moonstruck is just some of the celebrated work of this Canadian uh, film director. Now, uh, we've he we've been hearing a lot from people that knew him and that worked with him. One filmmaker uh, said that he, he was really down to earth. He actually said that he was the most un-Hollywood Hollywood person that he ever Ever met. We're hearing from the people that knew him and that worked with him. Take a listen to what this author had to say who wrote a biography on him. You'll see that he's roaring with energy. He's full of passion. When he's, um, when he's directing a sad scene, he's literally crying. There's literally a tear going down his face. Uh, he is just immensely engaged and plugged in. And I think actors really responded to that. Actors um, he was not the sort of director who would come in and dominate a set, um, but rather would take his cues from the actors, become the director that they needed him to be. And I think that that is how he was remem remembered among actors, very beloved in the industry. He had a very well-liked uh, person in the industry, a very good reputation. He's worked with some of the biggest stars, everyone from Sidney Poitier to, to Denzel Washington to uh, share as well. And so likely yeah. we'll get more reaction as this continues. Oh, yeah, a ton of reaction coming in. We're going to be speaking to uh, Canadian film director Adam McGoin in just a moment after we chat with you. Uh, but there will be talk about his legacy. Absolutely. Tell us more on that front. Well, obviously, the, the body of work that he has will stand. And that's part of his his legacy, but also he was very well known for uh, passing it on and really wanting to celebrate future uh, filmmakers and really setting them up to to succeed. He, in fact, was a, a founder of the Canadian Film Centre, and you know, although he he never won uh, a, an Oscar for directing, he actually got an honorary award uh, in 1999. And at the time, he decided to take that moment to share the spotlight, uh, saying that he wished that he received money with that award so that he could give it to the Canadian Film Centre uh, as, as well as the American uh, film as well. And so here's what he had to say to future filmmakers and the advice he had to share. Just find some good stories. Never mind the gross, the top 10, bottom 10, what's the rating, what's the demographics. Just. You know something, the biggest grossing picture is not necessarily the best picture. I want to tell you something. So just tell stories that move us to laughter and tears and perhaps reveal a little truth about ourselves. So he was all about the story and he was really all about celebrating human stories. That's how people uh, are remembering him today.
All right, Magda Gabrselassi in studio with us. Thank you, Magda. You're welcome. And as promised, for more on the life and the legacy of Norman Jewison, we're joined right now by acclaimed Canadian director Adam McGoyan. Adam is joining us from Toronto, where he is preparing for his latest film, Seven Veils, for its international premiere at the Berlin Film Festival. Mr. McGoyan, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I, I know this is probably a tough day for the film community. What are you uh, thinking about right now? What went through your mind when you heard of Norman Jewison's passing? Well, first of all, it's, it, he, he passed the morning before they're announcing the Academy Awards. Tomorrow morning is when they're announced. And uh, his films won almost 50 Academy Award nominations. Uh, he, no director, certainly no director from this country has ever reached the heights that Norman did. And yet he was incredibly generous. Um, you know, uh, I just owe so much to him. I remember when I was 13 years old going to the Haida Cinema in Victoria, B.C. and seeing Jesus Christ Superstar, and it changed my life. He he was able to make these films that were so emotionally accessible. And, um, and then also just following up with young filmmakers. I was just going through all these notes he sent me over the years. Huh. Uh, like, uh, like all these, I would ask, he knew how much I loved Jesus Christ Superstar. And he sends me this note talking about what it was like to work with the uh, Italian dolly grips, what it was like to be shooting in Israel with British grips and talking about the lenses he was using. <laughs> so I, I just had this really incredible sense that he was accessible at all times, no matter how how many awards he was getting or how much attention he got or how successful his films were. He was always there to support others. And, and I know that, you know, in terms of my own community, uh, so many filmmakers and producers and actors had that same relationship with him. Um, he was just really, we knew that he had to be incredibly tough to get what he got made. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, he had a lot of, uh, um, arguments with studio heads and uh, various people that, you know, he had to fight to get his films made, even though they were incredibly successful. Um, and so that was the other side that was so inspiring about Norman is that he made you, a, he was just a mentor. He was a true mentor, but mm. he was also really Canadian. He, he was born on the beaches. He grew up there. He was, he was involved with the first CBC series that, uh, that was ever aired, right? So from the early 50s, he was doing all of this work here in Canada before he made that move to the States. And then when he made that move, he just, you know, ascended really quickly. So he was supremely talented, but also incredibly charming and accessible. And I know that, you know, you talked a bit about some of his films. He also explored uh, real tough issues in some of his films, racial injustice. Uh, he was particularly yeah. fascinated with, with exploring that. Tell me a little bit about uh, you know, what he did on that front in movies like The Heat of the Night? Well, we have to remember that he grew up in a Toronto where there was, you know, really overt racism. Like even I remember reading in, in this wonderful biography that, you know, on Q Beach, there were signs that, you know, said like, like no blacks allowed or, you know, like, so it, it was really <laughs> a different time. And he also, uh, when he finished his uh, service, um, he spent time in the American South, and so he saw th that there was this incredible sense of injustice, and uh, he felt really passionately about that. Um, and, uh, you know, this was just woven into his fabric. Um, I, I think that, you know, he, you know, he talks about how important stories were, but he wanted to make stories that mattered to people, that served as models of how human beings can can behave with each other, yeah. and you know, we have to remember that Sidney uh, Poitier in in, uh, in 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 was the first black detective seen on on a big screen on, in Heat of the Night, and that and that moment where he slaps Rod Rod Seiger was was incredibly explosive. Like no one had ever seen a black actor do that before, and so you know Norman directed that scene. So these these are. These are incredible moments. He also directed Cher to getting an Oscar. I remember that uh, 1988, he was at the Berlin Film Festival. I'm going to be there next month and I'll be thinking about him because when I was there with one of my second films, he, he, he you know, had a dinner for all the young Canadian filmmakers that were there. Like, I remember, you know, that uh, that was really an incredible uh, moment. So it, he was just very Canadian, yeah. very proud of what this country could, could, could offer. And obviously came back and created the Canadian Film Center. You know, and, and when you look at the list of people who have gone through that and the talent that he was able to support, 
you know, that's part of his legend as well. So there's so many things to feel certainly sad about, but to celebrate, you know, in this incredible life that he had. And um, I'll just, you know, we'll all miss him, you know, tremendously. And I know, you know, I'm not going to ask you a question about his legacy, because as you said, you know, uh, everybody's got a different perspective on that, and that will be debated uh, through, through the coming days and years. But I, what I want to end on is the personal lesson, the biggest lesson that you learned from Norman Jewison you'll, that you'll take away. Well, you know, funny you should mention that. This is the last letter he wrote to me. You can see Norman Jewison. He's writing it by hand. Uh, he's like, this is, this is from, you know, what, by, by 2016. But he says, uh, we are both blessed to be filmmakers. Our work is uh, recorded like books, music, art, film is forever. And so, you know, like, <laughs> this is just, I have a whole desk of his notes in front of me here, but that was his last one. And I think that's just, you know, he, he made it really clear that what we were doing as filmmakers is valuable, that we are storytellers. Uh, we tell very different stories, certainly, like my films couldn't be any different from his, but he understood that this was a, uh, a way of exploring and creating models for how human beings might be able to be dealing with each other. Oh. And so we have that as his permanent sort of t testimony. Like he has an incredible body of work and it's so diverse and it's it's covering so many different genres. But, you know, we will we won't see someone like him emerging from this country because he was there from the very beginning of this period where film was able to actually break through barriers. He broke through so many barriers. Indeed he did. And I know that you are going to cherish that letter and those notes that he sent you. Adam McGoyne, appreciate you coming on Canada tonight this evening. Thank you. All right. Well, turning to other news now and the Liberal Cabinet retreat in Montreal. The federal government announced it is slashing the number of permits it grants to international students by one third. It's in part to address the availability of affordable housing. But in an interview with Power and Politics, Immigration Minister Mark Miller says Ottawa and provincial governments need to do a better job at addressing private colleges taking advantage of the system. Provinces are making money off this. Institutions are making money off this. The government of Canada is the only one sitting at the bar not drinking, and we're about to get stiffed with the bill. I had said previously that a national cap, if it were just imposed without having put some thought into it, weighing it by province, being fair, uh, is like doing surgery with a hammer. Uh, we need to put provinces on notice to get their acts together, but we also have a role in shoring up the role that we play in eradicating fraud. All right, so this is how it's going to work. Each province and territory will be allotted a cap based on its population. Opposition, opposition leader, that is, Pierre Polyev, says local governments and students are paying the price for mismanagement at the hands of the Prime Minister. He and Sean Fraser granted the study permits for tens of thousands of students to come and go to fake colleges that the Liberal government now admits are, were, quote, puppy mills. He did that. So let's not blame the students. Let's not blame other levels of government. Let's blame the one man who is responsible for this disaster. All right, let's dig in. We've got uh, David Cochran with us, the host of Power and Politics, who has been at the Liberal Cabinet Retreat in Montreal, covering this all day long. So, David, good to see you. Um, what stands out from today's announcement for you? Well, some of the language that Mark Miller used uh, really jumped out to me, Travis. He referred to a lot of the private college institutions that he's uh, taking aim at here as sham colleges offering sham degrees and suggesting that some of them just need to close and that would be a good thing uh, for that sector. And, and in the interview we did on the show a little while ago, uh, I asked him, like, what order of magnitude are we talking about there? And he said uh, it would be in the hundreds. So he believes there are hundreds of sham institutions out there across the country taking advantage of international students, charging them tuition fees three, four, five times what you would pay in a similar public institution, not providing any of the sort of wraparound and housing supports that, that you might have in other more regulated public sector uh, institutions, and saying, quite frankly, um, that they're going to put up barriers in these measures that they're going to bring in starting September 1 of this year. Uh, to make it that much harder for these institutions uh, to take advantage of what has been an incredibly 
lucrative stream of uh, tuition fees for them over the past number of years. And, and Miller, you know, he, in that interview that you did with him, he appeared to be putting a good portion of the onus on provincial government. Uh, obviously, the opposition parties mm -hmm. do not agree with that. And, and, and you know, Pierre Polyev said it's solely the feds here. What's your sense of how this is all playing out? Well, look, the federal government doesn't regulate post-secondary education, but it does approve the student permit. So there's a bit of, uh, of responsibility uh, to spread around here between the different levels of government. The, the trick is going to be, uh, Travis, how this is implemented, how surgical they are in this, because there are a lot of like very legitimate public sector uh, post-secondary institutions that, uh, because of tuition freezes and funding cuts, have turned to international students and the higher tuition they, fees they pay a, a, as a key source of revenue. The trick will be to deal with the ones that are considered illegitimate, considered to be sham institutions, in the words of Mark Miller, without punishing the legitimate universities and colleges of Canada uh, who offer legitimate opportunities to international students. Dave, you've had a long day. I'm going to let you go. Appreciate it. That is David Cochran, who has been covering the Thank Liberal you. retreat in Montreal all day long, the host of Power and Politics. Well, the Liberal Cabinet retreat will be one of the key topics that we'll be addressing later this evening on the Canada Tonight intersection. Every night, we'll be giving you a range of perspectives on the hot topics people are talking about in Canada Tonight. Our panel shares their thoughts on the student visa cap, Trump's chances in the New Hampshire primary, and whether robot chefs are set to replace us in the kitchen. That is all coming up on Canada Tonight. All right, let's turn to the United States now uh, and the story that is dominating coverage in the U.S. And it's a story with big implications for this country. Tomorrow, New Hampshire's primary. Well, voters will choose the candidates that they want to be their party's nominee for president. Katie Simpson joins us now live from Salem, New Hampshire. So, Katie, uh, set the scene for us there tomorrow. This could be a very big day for Donald Trump, really cementing his political comeback despite more than 90 criminal charges, despite very serious, credible allegations that he tried to subvert the 2020 election results. Um, it appears that Republican voters uh, could be positioning him to have an easy sort of push ahead to secure the nomination to be the Republican nominee for president. Uh, tomorrow's vote is Nikki Haley's sort of last chance to sort of build momentum and try and keep her campaign on track heading into the next sort of votes in the different states uh, that will take place after New Hampshire. This is the first primary. It's a really big deal. And we spoke with a uh, very high profile politician here in the United States who is supporting Nikki Haley. His name is Chris Sununu. He's the Republican governor of New Hampshire. We actually happened to just uh, catch him as he was leaving Nikki Haley's rally here in Salem. Uh, New Hampshire, uh, and he says that, you know, he's looking forward to the next 24 hours and he does have faith that Nikki Haley can beat Donald Trump. What do you have to say about the possibility of a Trump presidency or a Trump nomination? In Canada, the Canadian ambassador, the prime yeah. minister, they're consumed and concerned about this. Yeah. What do you have to say to Canadians? Oh, we're a long way from that. I think Nikki Haley's got a great shot. We haven't even had our first primary yet. It's going to happen tomorrow. So all we're focused on is kind of taking the states down one at a time behind Nikki Haley. And so where, what, what are you hoping for tomorrow? What is the realistic expectation? Oh, look, I, as long as we can build on this momentum she came out of Iowa with, uh, we wanted a second place finish. Obviously, we're going to get that. We wanted to clear the field. We've already done that. So anything we can do beyond that is just kind of gravy on top. And the fact that we're a stone's throw away from defeating Donald Trump, something no one thought was possible, is pretty exciting. Now, when it comes to what Nikki Haley's supporters and some of the people who are checking out her rally tonight, some undecided voters, the enthusiasm is more tempered. We spoke with a range of people who are hoping that this will be the boost of momentum Nikki Haley needs to be cement herself uh, as uh, someone who can stay in this campaign against Donald Trump, while others are just hoping it's anyone but him. Yeah, I would love to support Nikki Haley. I think uh, I think she has the best chance in the general election. It's going to be tough in the primary, but she, by far, every uh, every poll that comes out, she beats Biden in a general election. So I think she has the best chance. Um, I'm just here to see Nikki and to support her um, heading into the primary tomorrow. What do you think her chances are of winning this state? I'd like to say really good, but I think the reality is I don't think she'll win. I think there's just way too much momentum, unfortunately, for Donald Trump. Well, I'm just here to raise awareness or keep Ukraine in the forefront of everybody's minds. It's starting to fade in the news a little bit, especially with the Israeli-Gaza conflict. And Nikki Haley has the courage 
to stand up for Ukraine when it's not a popular topic with the Republicans. So at this point, Nikki Haley needs to, uh, well, her t campaign is hoping uh, that they can beat Donald Trump tomorrow. Realistically, she needs a strong second place showing, a really strong second place showing, if she is going to be able to continue to keep drawing in donations, build momentum, and try to continue to challenge Donald Trump. Yeah, she certainly does. It's going to be an uphill battle. We'll see what happens tomorrow. And, and Katie, you know, we were just talking to David, who is at that liberal retreat in Montreal. Let's head, you know, from south of the border, where you are, uh, up to this side of the border and the implications that this could potentially have here because political leaders in Ottawa, in Montreal right now, all over the country, they're watching this. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so Kirsten Hillman, who's Canada's ambassador to the U.S., I interviewed her on Saturday, and she told me that she'll be briefing cabinet ministers about the potential possibility of Donald Trump not just winning the Republican nomination, but Donald Trump going on to the return to the White House. She says that there are some concrete, practical things that Canada can do uh, to prepare for a possible change in power in the United States, and it's things that we saw that ha took place during the NAFTA negotiations, things like ensuring that Canadian politicians at the highest level Level, whether it be politicians or leaders in the business community or leaders in different uh, government sectors, to make sure that they refresh their relationships with the team around Donald Trump and really try to remind people around Donald Trump about why the Canada-U.S. relationship is important not just to Canada but to the United States. That, of course, was a large part of the strategy in NAFTA. The, the liberal Trudeau government tried to lean back on that if they do, in fact, have a different partner in the White House uh, after the November vote. All right, Katie Simpson, appreciate it. You're going to have a busy day tomorrow. <laughs> Looks cold down there as well. Stay warm. That is our Katie Simpson tracking all the details on the Republican primary race in New Hampshire. All right, for more on this, let's bring in Lara Trump right now. She's a former Trump 2020 advisor and host of the Right View podcast. Lara is also, of course, the daughter-in-law of Donald Trump. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for coming on the, the show. Uh, y you know, I just want to pick up on the last point that Katie made there, that, you know, this is going to have an impact if Donald Trump becomes the president again on the Canada-U.S. relationship. What is your thinking there, and, and, and what is the former president thinking about where that relationship is at right now? Well, I think that uh, obviously you are a bordering country to the United States. I think it is a very important partnership. We are allies, but of course, I think Canada, as well as the rest of the world, really has seen why it is very dangerous to have someone like Joe Biden, who exudes weakness on the world stage. As the leader of a country like the United States, you need someone who exudes strength. The truth is we want to stay out of wars. We want no new wars. And when Donald Trump was in office, you saw historic peace agreements in the Middle East. You look now at what's going on over there. You look now at Russia and Ukraine, as I just heard one of those gentlemen mention. Um, it is a complete disaster right now. I think the world, including Canadians, including uh, our friends to the South in Mexico, want Donald Trump back in office because when the United States is stable and strong, the rest of the world, of course, is stable and strong. Well, you just heard Chris Sununu there that, that our Katie Simpson was talking to in New Hampshire say that Nikki Haley is a stone's throw away from beating Donald Trump. What did you make of that statement? Uh, I, if you say 20 points is a stone's throw, perhaps, if coming in third in Iowa is a stone's throw, perhaps. I love how he poised it, of course, and said, oh, well, it's second place. Well, there are only two people running. Look, we don't take anything for granted in the Trump family or at the Trump campaign, and that's why my father-in-law has been on the ground quite a bit in New Hampshire. He wants to earn every single vote there. But I think the truth is you've seen the momentum in this party and it squarely sits behind Donald Trump. He won the Iowa caucuses by a historic 51%. You've never seen anything like that happen. I think what you're going to see tomorrow in New Hampshire is a, a win that will ensure that Donald Trump is indeed the Republican nominee. Nikki Haley was a great governor of the state of South Carolina, but I do not believe she has the support of the American people. I think that rests behind Donald J. So Trump. So not a chance for Nikki Haley, you don't think? I think it would be a very tough road ahead of her. I think that her supporters and her funders and donors are going to see after tomorrow that really there is no path to victory for Is her. your father-in-law looking at her uh, if she does not uh, come out victorious as a potential running mate? 
Well, I would never take anyone off the table for Donald Trump. I think the truth is that he surprises people all the time. I won't tell you whether or not he's looking at her, but I do think he already has made up his mind as to who his running mate will be, as he's alluded to a couple of times already. Do you, so do no you know news who to it break is? here tonight. <laughs> do you know um, who it is? I, perhaps I do, perhaps I don't. I, I, what I can tell you is that he will choose the best person, and I believe he has chosen the best person, to bring uh, the America First policies of his first time in the White House back to this country. He's chosen someone who I think he knows will be supportive and do everything possible to get this country back on track. People in this country are really hurting right now. We need a, a change in leadership. We need a change in direction. And I think that's why you've seen all this support behind him. So uh, stay tuned for the pick for uh, the VP running mate. So, so Laura, listen, you know, I appreciate you doing this interview. I, I think, you know, it's interesting to hear your perspective from being in the inner circle. But a lot of people in this country and yours would not agree with that view. They think that, you know, another potential Trump presidency would be disastrous. What do you say to people, not only in the United States, but here in Canada, that have that view of the situation? Well, I would ask them, what is it that they thought was such a disaster the first time around? Was it that, you know, people were prospering here in America, unlike we'd seen in many decades? You had things like manufacturing coming back, historic trade agreements with, you know, Canada and Mexico, historic trade agreements with China. As I just uh, alluded to, the Abraham Accords in the Middle East, two meetings with Kim Jong-un to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. How about an energy policy that made us energy independent and gave us strength on the world stage? Those were very important things. So I think my question would be, how was life for you as an American citizen or perhaps as a Canadian citizen when Donald Trump was in office? And if you take the tweets that people didn't like out of it and perhaps his personality out of it, and people are very honest, I don't think, Travis, there's a whole lot that people could say negative. In fact, I think you're going to see a lot of people who voted for Joe Biden in this country in 2020 coming over to vote for Donald Trump in 2024. I, I can't let you go without asking about the upcoming trials uh, and the court cases. Do you think that those are going to have a negative impact? And do you know if your father-in-law is going to testify in the defamation trial? Uh, well, I'll leave all the specifics, of course, to the lawyers. But what I can tell you is that people in this country have had what I believe is probably an inverse reaction to the intention of all of these indictments. The reality is Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. It is time for Joe Biden and his Department of Justice to do away with all of these indictments. I think a lot of people in this country feel like the goal of them was to deter Donald Trump, to perhaps throw mud his way and tell anyone who might potentially support him this might not be the guy for you. And it's actually, Travis, had the inverse effect of that. He, every single indictment, has gone up with his poll numbers, especially after that mug shot in Georgia, poll numbers through the roof. I think the people of this country who feel that this system here is not working for them understands that that same system is working against Donald Trump. Why all of the effort against one man? Why the attempt to keep one guy uh, so much out of the White House? I think it, it only rallies support behind him. And I think you're going to see proof of that tomorrow in New Hampshire. You'll see it in Nevada, South Carolina, and I believe you'll see it on November 5th when he's elected as the 47th president. Well, we shall see about that. No doubt who you are backing. Laura Trump, uh, <laughs> appreciate the time tonight. That is Laura Trump joining us from Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you so much. Well, still to come on Canada Tonight, former Toronto police officer James Forcillo testified today at an inquest into the shooting death of 18-year-old Sammy Atim. The RCMP goes under the microscope at the inquest into the mass stabbing at James Smith Cree Nation. And Rosalia Bella in the spotlight. I chat with the former Supreme Court Justice about widening political divisions in this country and, as we just talked about, in the South. You're watching Canada Tonight. Stick with us. Coming up in January on the Canada Tonight Spotlight. On the cusp of turning 40, Avril Lavigne looks back at her incredible career. Hockey superstar Connor McDavid pucks Oilers, his quest for the cup and being called the greatest player in the world right now. Astronaut Jeremy Hansen gives us an update on his mission to the moon. Plus, conversations with David Suzuki and his daughter. Killers of the Flower Moon star Tantu Cardinal reacts to the Oscar buzz around her new movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. The godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, stops by. Plus, a reunion of the cast of The Kids in the Hall. 
and former Supreme Court Justice Rosalia Bella and former journalist and Governor General Adrian Clarkson. It's all coming up in January on the Canada Tonight Spotlight. Well, welcome back. We want to introduce you to a new pillar of the program here at Canada Tonight. We're calling it Spotlight. We speak to some big names, some influential Canadians and people from around the world that are in the public eye. And in the spotlight tonight is Rosalia Bella, Canada's first female Jewish Supreme Court Justice. And we talked to her about a range of issues, including the renewed wave of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in this country and beyond. I caught up with her in December at her induction into Canada's Walk of Fame. Joining me now, former Supreme Court Justice Rosalia Bella. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You were born on July 1st, 1946, after a very dark period in this world. And some would say we're in a dark period right now. Are you hopeful? I'm always hopeful, but I don't think I've ever felt more worried about what was going on 
and the fact that we are we are in trouble trying to figure out what our global values are. In what are turbulent times, Rosalia Bella's insight, her long view of history, is valuable. Born in a displaced persons camp in Stuttgart, Germany in the late 40s, she came as a little girl with her family to Canada in 1950. She was a refugee. By 29, she became the first Jewish woman and youngest ever person to become a judge in Canada when she was appointed to the Ontario Family Court. In 2004, she became the first Jewish woman, the first refugee to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. Her life as a lawyer, teacher, and judge has centered around human rights and pushing equality forward. You cannot be born in the shadow of the Holocaust to two Jews who survived it without an exaggerated and fearless commitment to the pursuit of fairness and justice. What do you think your father would think about this time that we're in right now? It wouldn't be unfamiliar to him, but it would be very disappointing because we've gone so far the other way in my lifetime. I mean, the trajectory in Canada since we arrived has been ever inclusive, human rights, more and more people being brought into the mainstream, more and more sensitivity to those we left behind. I've never seen anything like this where people are silenced for taking a side that defends the right of the Jewish state to exist. We are seeing right now a lot of anti-Semitism. We We're are. seeing a lot of uh, Islamophobia. Um, does, does that trouble you or do you think that this is a blip? No, I think it's not a blip. I think it terrifies me, it doesn't trouble me. Yeah. I think um, I'm worried about the Islamophobia, of course, sure. but I am terrified by the anti-Semitism because it is a conflagration and it is spreading and it feels to me utterly irrational. There is um, a disproportionate assault on the only Jewish state in the world. So that, along with the rise of anti-Semitism, is very terrifying for somebody like me who came from people who survived the Holocaust. So that's just part one of our conversation. There's a lot more that Rosalie Abella had to say. Her thoughts on political discourse in this country right now, political polarization. We will have that coming up next hour. You're watching Canada Tonight. Stay with us.
former Toronto police officer who fatally shot a young man on a streetcar testified today at an inquest examining the teen's death. Then Constable James Forcillo shot 18-year-old Sammy Atim several times after he pulled out a knife on a streetcar in 2013. Forcillo was later convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to six years in jail. Now he is out on parole. Stephanie Skanderis is covering the inquest. So, Stephanie, uh, good evening to you. What did we learn today, and what did we hear from Forcillo this afternoon? Good evening, Travis. Well, James Forcillo has been questioned so far by lawyers from the inquest and also a little bit from the lawyers for Sammy Yatim's family. And one of the things that he was asked is what he thinks would have changed the course of that night 10 years ago now. And he said that if he'd had a taser instead of a gun, that would have, in his words, changed everything and he said none of us would be here today as and none of us would be here at this inquest he said that at the time only frontline supervisors had access to tasers something he called a giant failure but he says now that's been remedied with more tasers available he was also asked if he'd ever had de-escalation training something that he said he couldn't recall and he was also asked a lot of questions about past incidents involving use of force about his conduct towards the public when he was in traffic enforcement about how many many times he had drawn his gun in the past. He'd actually been flagged for drawing his firearm six times in the year leading up to that night that he killed Sammy Yatim. One incident was just 10 days before that. Now, he kind of brushed off a lot of those questions, um, saying that he either didn't recall the incidents. And he also said that working in traffic, writing up tickets, naturally ruffled feathers. Uh, that's what he said. But the point of this inquest is not to put Forcillo back on trial. He's already been convicted of attempted huh. murder. It's, uh, this inquest is mandatory under provincial law, but it's also to look at police decision making and police practices when dealing with people in crisis. This isn't it for Forcillo. He will appear at the inquest again tomorrow. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that you, you talked about that, uh, the broader issue of police training, that is something that is greatly debated right now. Well, let's talk about who else we heard from in this inquest so far, Stephanie. Yeah, and that issue is kind of the overarching uh, piece to all of this, something that's really what's being looked at. So last week, the inquest heard from the officer who did use the taser on Sammy Yatim. He explained how he arrived on the scene. He said that he saw Yatim on the floor of the streetcar holding the knife, as he said, firmly in his grasp, and that he didn't obey commands to drop it. So uh, he also said that he learned Yatim had been shot a split second before he used the taser, so giving his point of view. The inquest has also heard from the streetcar operator, other police officers, and then in the vein that we're talking about police responses, uh, today it heard from a witness who is an expert on police behavior and stress responses. Now, all of this is an effort to make sure this doesn't happen again, and the jury in this inquest can make recommendations when it's over to prevent future deaths. Okay. Stephanie, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, turning to Vancouver now, where transit workers are off the job following a contract dispute for 48 hours. Sarah Galashin is in Vancouver following the story for us. So, Sarah, a good evening to you. How is the evening commute so far? Travis, it's cold, it's wet, as Vancouver often is. There's been a lot of rain here today, and there's likely uh, more cars on the road than you would normally see. That's assuming, of course, that uh, the thousands who would be relying on bus service today were able to access a vehicle. It was known for a number of days that this was a possibility, but the actual decision to have job action happened at 3 a.m. in the morning when a lot of people were asleep. And so we know uh, a lot of uh, bus riders got to the stop this morning uh, unaware the bus wasn't coming. And I want to play you some of the, the sound that our crews picked up when they unfortunately had to tell people there was no bus coming to take them to university, to schools, to work. Take a listen. Trying to coordinate, like trying to gather people and see who can give rides and stuff. But yeah, because I guess getting like a cab and an Uber right now are really challenging. So I was quite surprised, but then because I'm, you know, back for the first day, I just didn't want to miss work, which is why I was so determined. I should have just called in sick, you know. I take the ride from my sea bus every day for 15 years right now. And now this is stop and it's impossible. And I can't believe it and I'm very upset because I don't know how can I go to Vancouver right now because for this strike, I don't know when it's going to over. TransLink's the body that oversees uh, transit in uh, Metro Vancouver. They estimate more than 300,000 people rely on these services, uh, all of uh, transit in Metro Vancouver every day. Today and tomorrow, there is no bus service that they can rely on. 
or CBUS, as you just heard there. Uh, TransLink is offering recommendations like carpooling, walking, cycling. Like I mentioned, Travis, the weather's not great right now. As for SkyTrain, which is the monorail uh, sort of subway system that connects communities throughout Metro Vancouver, that is uh, still operating right now, uh, as well as West Van's Blue Bus, Handy Dart. Those services not affected at this point. Right, yeah, I like the alternatives there, walk or, <laughs> or cycle. Uh, so Sarah, what happens next? Uh, well, it's really going to depend at the two sides. The Coast Mountain Bus Company and uh, the union want to come to the table or will come to the table. And right now, based on public statements, they seem to be pretty far apart in terms of the core issue, which is wage parity for 180 uh, bus supervisors. Um, so they seem pretty far away. We asked TransLink. TransLink was asked what might happen next in terms of uh, other services that could be canceled. And they said they didn't know to ask uh, the union. And so the union was asked, uh, where would this go? We know today and tomorrow no bus service, but what beyond then? Take a listen. We will continue with our overtime ban. And then um, clearly we don't have a deal now, so we'll have to plan our next escalation. Obviously, it's going to be uh, an escalation, which means more than the current one. Um, and um, I'm sure that we'll be announcing something at some point. Uh, and as soon as we figure that out, we'll let you know. So you heard that word escalation. Now, what might that mean? Uh, it's, it's sort of anyone's guess, but possibly picketing around SkyTrain stations. Right now, that's not allowed, but the question is before the Labor Relations Board. So far as we know, Travis, there is not a hearing scheduled, but we are waiting to see if there will be one and whether an answer to that would come. And like I say, SkyTrain's a, a, a sort of crucial service here because it doesn't just connect people within a city, it connects city to city. Uh, and that would, uh, if it were to uh, be picketed and, and it were to stop because of this job action, that would definitely mean a, a lot more cars on the highways. It's gonna become a, a more serious issue. But for now, uh, for sure we can say, uh, don't rely on a bus tomorrow, uh, yeah. figure out an alternative. Yeah, absolutely. It would be like Toronto traffic. Sarah Galashin, uh, <laughs> appreciate the update. Uh, we'll keep on top of this one. That's our Sarah Galashin in Vancouver. All right, when we come back, why a new temple in India is stirring up controversy ahead of a national election this spring. That's right after this. Stay with us on Canada Tonight.
measures are not against individual international students. They are to ensure that as future students arrive in Canada, they receive the quality of education that they signed up for and the hope that they were provided in their home countries. That is Minister Mark Miller, who is referring to a cap he is placing on the number of student permits for the next two years. It targets smaller private institutions that are accused of charging high tuition fees while providing few resources to students. It is also aimed at helping solve the housing crisis by cutting the number of international students in Canada. Well, a controversial Hindu temple opened today in northern India. It's built on land where a historic mosque once stood. The site has long been a religious flashpoint among India's Hindu majority and the Muslim minority population. The event is being heavily promoted by India's populist leader as he seeks re-election. Shalima Shivdi reports. A raw display of Hindu faith lining the streets of Ayodhya. Thousands of devotees have descended on the holy city. Glory to Lord Ram, they shout, one of Hinduism's most revered deities. But the new temple dedicated to him is steeped in controversy. Built on the ruins of a centuries-old mosque demolished by a Hindu mob in 1992. An illegal act that sparked riots that killed 2,000 people, mostly Muslims. Millions in India believe this was where Ram was born and that there was a temple here first. As India's Prime Minister led the consecration of the temple, he leaned into those emotions. Ram Our Ram has arrived today after waiting for centuries, Narendra Modi said. Missing from the crowd are leaders of India's political opposition, who accuse Modi of manipulating a religious event for a political boost with his Hindu base. Modi's promotion of the temple, another sign for many observers of Hindu dominance in a country that has secularism enshrined in its constitution. It kind of sends a very strong message down to the Hindu voter that this is a party and a government that protects and furthers Hindu interests. But for those who've been camping out for days close to the temple, there's already fervor and faith in Modi. He's made our dreams come true with the temple, says Parya Garg. It's about pride in being Hindu. In the shadow of this new temple and the mass celebrations, Ayodhya's Muslim community is quietly resigned to being sidelined in the city they've lived in for generations. Still, there's a sense of unease. The mosque to replace the one destroyed, ordered by India's top court, is stalled. The land allotted, isolated, and far from the city center. I have prepared it after. Khalik Ahmad Khan is a litigator who carefully documented the Muslim deaths in Ayodhya after the mosque was raised. This is the fear. This is the fear. This may happen. Violence may happen after 22nd January. And Muslims are helpless. He says for his community, there's little faith left in India's institutions. With religion and politics deeply intertwined and an election this spring that's likely to further divide the country. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ayodhya, Uttar Pradesh. At least eight people have died and dozens are missing following a landslide in China. Rescue workers are searching for survivors in the southwestern province of Yunnan. The Chinese government has called for an all-out rescue operation. Crews are working in sub-zero temperatures. The mountainous region is prone to landslides, but the cause of this one has not yet been determined. Eleven years ago, at least 18 people were killed in a landslide in that area. All right, we got plenty more ahead here on Canada Tonight, including our intersection panel, the part of the show where we unpack some of the hot topics trending in Canada Tonight and give you a range of perspectives. That discussion coming up in the next hour here on Canada Tonight. Stick with us.
It is 6 o'clock in Calgary, 7 o'clock in Montreal, and 9.30 in St. John's, Newfoundland. This is Canada Tonight. Coming up, a giant of Canadian filmmaking has passed, remembering the life and legacy of Norman Jewison. Plus, liberal retreat amid falling poll numbers, Justin Trudeau looks to change his party's fortunes as party leaders gather in Montreal. And it's a two-person race for the Republican nomination. Donald Trump and Nikki Haley get ready to face off in New Hampshire. Well, the film world is mourning tonight. The death of Canadian director Norman Jewison. His career spanned decades and dozens of films and shows. Jewison was an inspiration to many in Hollywood and beyond. That includes acclaimed Canadian director Adam McGowan. He passed the morning before they're announcing the Academy Awards. Tomorrow morning is when they're announced. And uh, his films won almost 50 Academy Award nominations. Uh, he, no director, certainly no director from this country, has ever reached the heights that Norman did. And yet he was incredibly generous. Um, you know, I just owe so much to him. I remember when I was 13 years old going to the Haida Cinema in Victoria, B.C. and seeing Jesus Christ Superstar, and it changed my life. He, he was able to make these films that were so emotionally accessible. And, um, and then also just following up with young filmmakers. I was just going through all these notes he sent me over the years. Huh. Uh, like, uh, like all the, I would ask, he knew how much I loved Jesus Christ Superstar. And he sends me this note talking about what it was like to work with uh, Italian dolly grips, what it was like to be shooting in Israel with British grips and talking about the lenses he was using. <laughs> so I, I just had this really incredible sense that he was accessible at all times, no matter how how many awards he was getting or how much attention he got or how successful his films were. He was always there to support others. And, and I know that, you know, in terms of my own community, uh, so many filmmakers and producers and actors had that same relationship with him. Um, he was just really, we knew that he had to be incredibly tough to get what he got made. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, he had a lot of, uh, um, arguments with studio heads and uh, various people that, you know, he had to fight to get his films made, even though they were incredibly successful. Um, and so that was the other side that was so inspiring about Norman is that he made you, a, he was just a mentor. He was a true mentor, but mm. he was also really Canadian. He, he was born on the beaches. He grew up there. He was, he was involved with the first CBC series that, uh, that was ever aired, right? So from the early 50s, he was doing all of his work here in Canada before he made that move to the States. And then when he made that move, he just, you know, ascended really quickly. So he was supremely talented, but also incredibly charming and accessible. And I know that, you know, you talked a bit about some of his films. He also explored uh, real tough issues in some of his films, racial injustice. Uh, he was particularly yeah. fascinated with, with exploring that. Tell me a little bit about uh, you know, what he did on that front in movies like The Heat of the Night? Well, we have to remember that he grew up in a Toronto where there was, you know, really overt racism. Like even I remember reading in, in this wonderful biography that, you know, on Kew Beach, there were signs that, you know, said like, like no blacks allowed or, you know, like, so it, it was really <laughs> a different time. And he also, uh, when he finished his uh, service, um, he spent time in the American South, and so he saw th that there was this incredible sense of injustice, and uh, he felt really passionately about that. Um, and, uh, you know, this was just woven into his fabric. Um, I, I think that, you know, he, you know, he talks about how important stories were, but he wanted to make stories that mattered to people, that served as models of how human beings can can behave with each other, yeah. and you know, we have to remember that Sidney uh, Poitier in in, uh, in 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 was the first black detective seen on on a big screen on, in Heat of the Night, and that and that moment where he slaps Rod Rod Seiger was was incredibly explosive. Like no one had ever seen a black actor do that before, and so you know Norman directed that scene. So these these are. These are incredible moments. He also directed Cher to getting an Oscar. I remember that uh, 1988, he was at the Berlin Film Festival. I'm going to be there next month, and I'll be thinking about him because when I was there with one of my second films, he, he, he you know, had a dinner for all the young Canadian filmmakers that were there. Like, I remember, you know, that uh, that was really an incredible uh, moment. So 
it, he was just very Canadian, yeah. very proud of what this country could, could, could offer. And obviously came back and created the Canadian Film Center. You know, and, and when you look at the list of people who have gone through that and the talent that he was able to support, you know, that's part of his legend as well. So there's so many things to feel certainly sad about, but to celebrate, you know, in this incredible life that he had. And um, I'll just, you know, we'll all miss him, you know, tremendously. Our thanks to Canadian film director Adam Agoyan. Well, turning now to the Liberal Cabinet retreat in Montreal, the federal government announced it is slashing the number of permits it grants to international students by one-third. It's in part to address the availability of affordable housing. But in an interview with Power and Politics Immigration Minister Mark Miller says Ottawa and provincial governments need to do a better job at addressing private colleges taking advantage of the system. Provinces are making money off this. Institutions are making money off this. The government of Canada is the only one sitting at the bar not drinking and we're about to get stiffed with the bill. I had said previously that a national cap, if it were just imposed without having put some thought into it, weighing it by province, being fair, uh, is like doing surgery with a hammer. Uh, we need to put provinces on notice to get their acts together, but we also have a role in shoring up the role that we play in eradicating fraud. Well, each province and territory will be allotted a cap based on its population. Opposition leader Pierre Polyev says local governments and students are paying the price for mismanagement at the hands of the Prime Minister. He and Sean Fraser granted the study permits for tens of thousands of students to come and go to fake colleges that the Liberal government now admits are, were quote, puppy mills. He did that. So let's not blame the students, let's not blame other levels of government, let's blame the one man who is responsible for this disaster. All right, let's dig in. We've got uh, David Cochran with us, the host of Power and Politics, who has been at the Liberal Cabinet Retreat in Montreal, covering this all day long. So, David, good to see you. Um, what stands out from today's announcement for you? Well, some of the language that Mark Miller used uh, really jumped out to me, Travis. He referred to a lot of the private college institutions that he's uh, taking aim at here as sham colleges offering sham degrees and suggesting that some of them just need to close and that would be a good thing uh, for that sector. And, and in the interview we did on the show a little while ago, uh, I asked him, like, what order of magnitude are we talking about there? And he said uh, it would be in the hundreds. So he believes there are hundreds of sham institutions out there across the country taking advantage of international students, charging them tuition fees three, four, five times what you would pay in a similar public institution, not providing any of the sort of wraparound and housing supports that, that you might have in other more regulated public sector uh, institutions, and saying, quite frankly, um, that they're going to put up barriers in these measures that they're going to bring in starting September 1 of this year. Uh, to make it that much harder for these institutions uh, to take advantage of what has been an incredibly lucrative stream of uh, tuition fees for them over the past number of years. And, and Miller, you know, he, in that interview that you did with him, he appeared to be putting a good portion of the onus on provincial governments. Uh, obviously, the opposition parties mm -hmm. do not agree with that. And, and, and you know, Pierre Polyev said it's solely the feds here. What's your sense of how this is all playing out? Well, look, the federal government doesn't regulate post-secondary education, but it does approve the student permit. So there's a bit of, uh, of responsibility uh, to spread around here between the different levels of government. The, the trick is going to be, uh, Travis, how this is implemented, how surgical they are in this. Because there are a lot of like very legitimate public sector uh, post-secondary institutions that, uh, because of tuition freezes and funding cuts, have turned to international students and the higher tuition they, fees they pay as a key source of revenue. The trick will be to deal with the ones that are considered illegitimate, considered to be sham institutions in the words of Mark Miller, without punishing the legitimate universities and colleges of Canada uh, who offer legitimate opportunities to international students. Dave, you've had a long day. I'm going to let you go. Appreciate it. That is David Cochran, who has been covering the Thank liberal you. retreat in Montreal all day long, the host of Power and Politics. All right, let's turn now to the south of the border and a story with big implications for this country as well. Tomorrow's New Hampshire primary. Voters will choose the candidates they want to be their party's nominee for president. Katie Simpson set the scene for us in Salem, New Hampshire. This could be a very big day for Donald Trump, really cementing his political comeback despite more than 90 criminal charges, despite very serious, credible allegations that he tried to subvert 
the 2020 election results, um, it appears that Republican voters uh, could be positioning him to have an easy sort of push ahead to secure the nomination to be the Republican nominee for president. Uh, tomorrow's vote is Nikki Haley's sort of last chance to sort of build momentum and try and keep her campaign on track heading into the next sort of votes in the different states uh, that will take place after New Hampshire. This is the first primary. It's a really big deal. And we spoke with a very high profile politician here in the United States who is supporting Nikki Haley. His name is Chris Sununu. He's the Republican governor of New Hampshire. We actually happened to just uh, catch him as he was leaving Nikki Haley's rally here in Salem, uh, New Hampshire. Uh, and he says that, you know, he is looking forward to the next 24 hours and he does have faith that Nikki Haley can beat Donald Trump. What do you have to say about the possibility of a Trump presidency or a Trump nomination? In Canada, the Canadian ambassador, the prime yeah. minister, they're consumed and concerned about this. Yeah. What do you have to say to Canadians? Oh, we're a long way from that. I think Nikki Haley's got a great shot. We haven't even had our first primary yet. It's going to happen tomorrow. So all we're focused on is kind of taking the states down one at a time behind Nikki Haley. And so where, what, what are you hoping for tomorrow? What is the realistic expectation? Oh, look, I, as long as we can build on this momentum she came uh, out of Iowa with, uh, we wanted a second place finish. Obviously, we're going to get that. We wanted to clear the field. We've already done that. So anything we can do beyond that is just kind of gravy on top. And the fact that we're a stone's throw away from defeating Donald Trump, something no one thought was possible, is pretty exciting. Now, when it comes to what Nikki Haley's supporters and some of the people who are checking out her rally tonight, some undecided voters, the enthusiasm is more tempered. We spoke with a range of people who are hoping that this will be the boost of momentum Nikki Haley needs to be cement herself uh, as uh, someone who can stay in this campaign against Donald Trump, while others are just hoping it's anyone but him. Yeah, I would love to support Nikki Haley. I think uh, I think she has the best chance in the general election. It's going to be tough in the primary, but she, by far, every uh, every poll that comes out, she beats Biden in a general election. So I think she has the best chance. Um, I'm just here to see Nikki and to support her um, heading into the primary tomorrow. What do you think her chances are of winning this state? I'd like to say really good, but I think the reality is I don't think she'll win. I think there's just way too much momentum, unfortunately, for Donald Trump. Well, I'm just here to raise awareness or keep Ukraine in the forefront of everybody's minds. It's starting to fade in the news a little bit, especially with the Israeli-Gaza conflict. And Nikki Haley has the courage to stand up for Ukraine when it's not a popular topic with the Republicans. So at this point, Nikki Haley needs to, uh, well, her t campaign is hoping uh, that they can beat Donald Trump tomorrow. Realistically, she needs a strong second place showing, a really strong second place showing, if she is going to be able to continue to keep drawing in donations, build momentum, and try to continue to challenge Donald Trump. Yeah, she certainly does. It's going to be an uphill battle. We'll see what happens tomorrow. And, and Katie, you know, we were just talking to David, who is at that liberal retreat in Montreal. Let's head, you know, from south of the border, where you are, uh, up to this side of the border and the implications that this could potentially have here because political leaders in Ottawa, in Montreal right now, all over the country, they're watching this. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so Kirsten Hillman, who's Canada's ambassador to the U.S., I interviewed her on Saturday, and she told me that she'll be briefing cabinet ministers about the potential possibility of Donald Trump not just winning the Republican nomination, but Donald Trump going on to the return to the White House. She says that there are some concrete, practical things that Canada can do uh, to prepare for a possible change in power in the United States, and it's things that we saw that ha took place during the NAFTA negotiations, things like ensuring that Canadian politicians at the highest level Level, whether it be politicians or leaders in the business community or leaders in different uh, government sectors, to make sure that they refresh their relationships with the team around Donald Trump and really try to remind people around Donald Trump about why the Canada-U.S. relationship is important not just to Canada but to the United States. That, of course, was a large part of the strategy in NAFTA. The, the liberal Trudeau government tried to lean back on that if they do, in fact, have a different partner in the White House uh, after the November vote. All right, our Katie Simpson in Salem, New Hampshire. Well, stick with us. We're coming up to the intersection here on Canada tonight. Our panel breaks down the impact of Ottawa's cap on student permits. Will it be enough to address the housing crunch? They'll also discuss whether it will affect the Liberals' polling numbers, which have been on the decline in recent weeks, recent months. And speaking of polling numbers, we'll go south of the border, where Donald Trump looks set to win the Republican nomination for president. That is all ahead here on Canada Tonight.
These measures are not against individual international students. They are to ensure that as future students arrive in Canada, they receive the quality of education that they signed up for and the hope that they were provided in their home countries. Okay, there is Minister Miller referring to a cap that he is placing on the number of student permits for the next two years. It targets smaller private institutions that are accused of charging high tuition fees while providing few resources to students. It also is aimed at helping solve the housing crisis by cutting the number of international students in Canada. It is time for Intersection, the part of the show where we unpack some of the hot topics trending in Canada tonight and give you a range of perspectives meeting at the Intersection tonight. Brandon Gomez, founder and CEO of Gomez Media, Larissa Waller, principal of GT and Company, and former executive director of communications to Premier Doug Ford, Gertan Singh, the former Ontario NDP MPP for what writing? Brampton East. Brampton East. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Vice Brampton. President at Crestview Strategy. And joining us from St. John's, comedian Mary Walsh. So, uh, Mary, good to see you. Hello. Uh, let's start with that big announcement today from Mark Miller. Uh, to your cap being put on international student visas. Here's a little bit more from the immigration minister. It's unacceptable that some private institutions have taken advantage of international students by operating under resourced campuses lacking supports for students, and charging high tuition fees, all the while significantly increasing their intake of international students. Okay, I'm going to go to Mary first, since you have been waiting patiently for some time, I hear. Um, <laughs> what, what's your, what is your take on this? You know, the immigration minister seems to be blaming these private institutions here, and a lot of folks say, including the opposition, this is squarely the government's fault. Well, I mean, he didn't say it was the government's fault. He said it was Justin Trudeau's fault entirely, right. the prime minister's fault. Laid at his door. And I actually have a, my face broke out, and I thought, that is Justin Trudeau's fault, really, this country. Uh, but um, I just think, <laughs> I, I don't get the, uh, I don't get the whole housing thing. I mean, what does international students have to do with the housing crisis, which has been going on since the 80s, and is a direct result of, uh, government after government after government not building new housing. We were building 20,000 houses, affordable houses a year in the 70s and then uh, increasingly in the 80s yeah. and the 90s we just stopped. And that's the housing crisis so why blame it on international students? And then one last thing, the whole private college thing, that was encouraged when we privatized everything. And we had a private college here that's still in court, uh, Academy Can Canada, which was just a con job. Uh, you know, people, and uh, mostly they were taking in people that were retraining, and so the government was paying them really well to retrain people who had been iron workers in to be uh -huh. how to plug in a uh, you know electrical appliance according to my brother who took one of those courses but anyway <laughs> yes so I, I don't get it I don't get why we're blaming um, international students but if they're not being taken care of and if these private institutions aren't helping them get housing then for for heaven's sakes yes cut well, down yeah well I mean certainly Larissa there are bad actors but do you think that it uh, you know is squarely on these institutions as, as you know the, the minister seemed to allude to there okay so show me the Canadian family that's going to bed at night worrying about the number of international students coming into Canada it's not something normal people think about. But if you look at the numbers, we had something like 800,000 visas issued to these international students in a country of 40 million. That seems awfully high, right? Yeah. StatsCan did um, some sort of study of this, I don't know, a few, like, not too long ago. Yeah. And they found that in some um, of these cases, in some of these private colleges, and they call them like strip mall colleges, um, something like 95% of students weren't showing up. So it was a bit of a backdoor loophole to get into the country. I blame the government for not closing that loophole, but I think trying to make a correlation between international students and our housing crisis is a bit of a stretch. And I'm like floored that this is what the government came up with. Well, I mean, there is yeah. an effect though, we have to be honest. Like, as we talked about, like the rental supply has not been increased. We know that there's a record amount of Canadians born here who live here who can't afford to get a home, who can't even find a place to rent. So when you're adding 
new people to come to the country who are coming to schools and they also need a place to live, then you're compounding yeah. the demand. Yeah. So that, that's going to that's yeah. have an effect. But there's also responsibility that lays at the foot of premiers. Like in Ontario, for example, we know that there's been calls by the Ontario, uh, you know, post-secondary institutions um, calling for, like, increased funding, right? Under, Premier Doug Ford has basically put a tuition freeze. Uh, universities, colleges cannot afford, right? They, they need the funds. They, they're not getting it from students. Yeah. So they're relying more and more on international students. And so this is all part of the problem at the same time. Oh, but but the solution to, to housing, yeah. it, this is exactly like to the point earlier made, Canada used to build affordable housing. We used to be an active player in making sure that Canadians can afford that dream. And because instead, we believe that it was a fundamental right. It was a fundamental right. That every right. Canadian deserved to be housed. So is that dream gone And I don't know when, now, we, when we lost that. Well, well I'll the, tell you part of the problem it. is that we, we haven't been keeping up with demand. Like, you yeah. look at the amount of housing stock. But it's not the problem that we haven't been keeping up with demand. The problem is that the government has stopped making... We've cut back entirely on our commitment to that every no, Canadian demand is deserves for, I mean, housing. Keep, the supply has not kept up with demand. We've see, we're seeing a record amount of people coming to this country. Yeah. Uh, people want to come here for prosperity reasons. Of course, Canada is one of the best countries in the entire world, but if the supply is not keeping up, a lot of that is at the municipal level with zoning. We've heard this from mayors. We've heard this from premiers trying to tackle this issue. All of that factors into the equation. But we have to look at the history of this as well. Under Pierre Palavert, when he was in yeah. ministry, 800,000 affordable homes were sold off by the, by the, by the then Conservative government. And the impact is what we're seeing. It, we're sell, they sold off affordable homes. Under the Liberals, not building enough affordable homes. And now we have people who are making professional wages who can't afford a roof over their head. So this is an issue that has so many deeper roots than just international students. And, you well, can go government or, or, by government or putting it at the back. doorstep of Justin Trudeau, which Mr. Polly Everett does every time he stubs his toe. Well, and, uh, he well, goes, okay, well, okay, that's, and, Pierre, that's Justin Trudeau. And I'm going to pause, pause you on that, Mary, because I do want to zoom out, because, yeah, we could talk about housing and immigration for some time, and those are issues that will likely... Uh, be hammered by the opposition in the House when it resumes next week. But the Liberals, as we know, because uh, our David Cochran is there right now at the Montreal retreat that they are having, a cabinet retreat, uh, you know, there's a new poll out that says, that shows once again uh, that they've got a clear lack of support right now, that their numbers are dropping. How much of the challenge does this pose to the Liberals? How do they come back from this? And what does their footing need to be as they start this new session of the House? Larissa. I think they've got to figure out who are they talking to, right? Who, who are they trying to convince to support them and, and, and to vote for them? What's interesting about the poll that just came out, the abacus poll, yeah, it's, it's really great for partisan conservatives that Pierre is so high in the polls. Um, and, and the risk there is obviously that that, that momentum drops but the really fascinating part is the people who are even saying that they're going to vote liberal are saying that they're voting liberal to stop Pierre Polyev they're not voting liberal because they're so inspired by Justin Trudeau and that's great news for Jagmeet Singh well the thing is you have to tackle but, but, the issues but of course you have to tackle people the issues. are sick of Trudeau he's been in for so long and that that's what happens in this country and in other western democracies that you have somebody uh, there for eight years and then people go I'm so tired of him Of course I was just on tour out in the west they're not just tired of him but everybody has F Trudeau uh, bumper yeah. stickers I, I guess it isn't that everybody well, wants to sleep with the Prime Minister. That's what they were chanting at the UFC game the other night. I'm not sure they it's may true. want to have sex with the Prime Minister I'm not sure. But, hold on, but hold it on. doesn't I don't Sorry, think that's it. The tail we can't, that we can't just <laughs> minimize it to people just being tired of Trudeau like the problems are real right the housing crisis is real the affordability crisis is real and if you know if, if you've been in government for eight years now right that's eight years of people seeing and going through life experiencing one thing and coming out on the other side of it experiencing but that's something the way else it is around the world and right the, now but, but if you're we a leader you got to you got to you got to fix that the every problem. other western democracy is experiencing at this point and to put it at the le at the feet of the liberals is just to be silly I, but i understand that people need a change i mean people do need a change but it, it's Maybe not about Justin change i don't think you necessarily down need the change of the but they want to see the government take action i think what we saw today but from the, the minister has miller taken action the government got us through the, the pandemic we, saw today. we this did better in the action. pandemic than any other g7 country the government got us through the biggest emergency uh, that 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 this country or many other countries have ever seen right so it isn't like the government isn't doing anything 
I, I, think, people that. I think nobody people said that. They just said that there's been problems that have been created under this government that have been exasperated, time. and people want to see some action. No, they haven't. There the, hasn't. The, the, like the time, housing time, crisis time has this not been. You need to get this Yeah, I literally need like the the bell from the view. I'm giving you the last word in real quick 20 seconds. I'll say very quickly is this: the issue in Canada is this. Yeah. We don't vote in parties; we vote them out. And the reality is, because of eight years of of life not getting better for individuals, we see this great dissatisfaction and a want for change. But a change for what? And the fear I have is that under the Conservatives, we know what they do when it comes to housing. They privatize, they sell off public housing, they don't make life affordable, they build incredibly expensive homes for the very few and not affordable that's homes for the very true. many. And that's the kind of investment we need as a nation. That's not just true, Larissa says. Okay, we're going to hit pause on this conversation right now. Coming up, we got much more on the intersection. Our panel digs into the latest news ahead of tomorrow's New Hampshire primary. And also, restaurant robots. What does automation mean for the future of those in the service industry? And we'll have the panel weigh in on my interview with Laura Trump, which a lot of people are doing right now on social media. That is all coming up next here on Canada Tonight.
going head to head with the Donald after Ron DeSantos dropped out yesterday. Here's what Donald Trump's daughter in law, Laura Trump, told me last hour on Canada Tonight. Unlike we'd seen in many decades, you had things like manufacturing coming back, historic trade agreements with, you know, Canada and Mexico, historic trade agreements with China. As I just uh, alluded to, the Abraham Accords in the Middle East, two meetings with Kim Jong un to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. How about an energy policy that made us energy independent and gave us strength on the world stage? So as I said to her in the interview, you know, a lot of people would be appalled that I even had Laura Trump on, which Clearly, you know, engaging from social media, some people are. But it's, it, I thought, important to get that insight from that inner circle. Not surprisingly, she is listing all of these accomplishments that she says that the former president, uh, you know, had a list of when he was in office. W what do you make of what she had to say there, uh, Brandon? Well, here's the thing. I think uh, you need to have her on. And I say that because I think the reality of Trump being the nominee going up against Biden is almost for certain at mm. this point. Like, let's look at Nikki Haley. She is not performing well. She has changed her tone on a lot of issues like America being a racist country, which just a few months ago yeah. she was highlighting how she experienced racism to obviously try to gear towards that Trump base to try to salvage what she has left about her for her campaign. So this is a reality. He could become president again. And it's exactly why Trudeau and his cabinet ministers are talking about this very scenario which potentially could take place. Now, the re could, is he going to beat Biden is, 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 is the question that everybody should be asking right. themselves. And the reality that for the Democrats is that they really have to ask themselves, like, do they have enough energy to go against a Trump machine that's going to be pushing out attacks left, right, and center, direct every single day? Because his base is motivated. Are the Democrats motivated? A lot of them aren't. Yeah. Well, no, I they, mean, uh, well, go ahead. Look, they've made a martyr out of Trump, she? right? With who all this, is she? Who lo, is she who? the one who's married to Beavis or to Butthead? <laughs> so, like, who knows she has the Trump of, name, and that's all that matters for a lot of Trump supporters. It's the first I'm day of the mean, show, Mary. You're going to get me in trouble. Uh, but she <laughs> is uh, uh, married to Eric Trump. The younger, the younger son. I was son. just making a joke. I know she's I know, married yeah, to Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't figure out if he's Beavis or Butthead, whichever one he is. Well, since but you have waited, let me ask you your thoughts on what she had to say. What are you going to say about her father-in-law? What are your thoughts, Mary, on what she had to say and also Nikki well, Haley's chances? Well, what is she going to say? And all I, all I worry is I pray for poor Nikki Haley tomorrow night in New Hampshire that he won't grab her by the, you know, hoo-ha. She is a woman and, you know, he can do that because that's what you get when you're rich and famous. And uh, so, you know, or, or, or stand behind her and try to... Uh, to intimidate her. So I, I, I'm worried about Nikki Haley tomorrow in New Hampshire. Uh, but, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. You know, Ron DeSantis tried to out Trump Trump, but why out Trump Trump when they're still Trump? I mean, the Mango Mussolini is still among us. He's the ex Cheeto in chief, could become the Cheeto in chief again. But Nikki Haley doesn't seem to offer much more than that. But I think the Democrats will be. Um, uh, will be uh, motivated. I mean, I think there's lots of motivation. The, the I think the Republicans are like only 30 percent, maybe, of the American. It's the independents who are they motivated? Are they motivated? Uh, right? Well, I, I mean, that, that, that's a, it's a certainly an important question, uh, Larissa. Yeah, no, let me I think let you the problem is like they're going to stay home, and we're talking about motivation. So if you're looking at like where we are right now, where basically the two choices seem to be shaving up to be Biden and Trump, right? Like, the problem is people are going to stay home. The Democrats have made a martyr out of Trump. So they're the ones who've really catapulted Trump to this, you know, de facto win. They helped him every step of the way, and they made reasonable, more thoughtful candidates like Nikki Haley. They put it in a position where it's almost impossible for her to win in New Hampshire. The reason I think the Democrats actually have a very strong chance is this. The left in America is focused about actually improving people's lives. Uh, uh, President Biden is one of the most pro-union presidents in the history, recent history in America. Uh, they want to, you know, increase access to health care, education, real uh, protect a woman's right to choose right. and, and her, her bodily autonomy. The right has lost the plot in America. The GOP had people on a debate stage talking about conspiracies like the white replacement theory. Nikki Haley is talked about the Civil War and refused to talk about slavery. Uh, we have a 
uh, GOP that's obsessed with culture war issues and demonizing marginalized LGBTQ plus communities. Those actually are issues that are not going to directly improve people's lives. Right. Working on health care, education, workers' rights, that's what's going to uplift people, not these evil culture wars and playing into these really but dangerous conspiracies. There's this whole section it... in the middle that's not as concerned about social justice issues, and I'm not, I'm not degrading social these justice issues. These are social issues. justice issues. No, but I'm telling you, there's you, this whole you, section you, in the middle. Workers' rights is that, about improving your ability to survive. There's this whole section in the middle that cares about affordability, that cares about the... I don't think there's a whole section right there. I, I, I do speaking, agree. Neither party Everybody is speaking to those who care about money. They're going to save them. Wait, 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 wait. Pause again. I, Sorry. Let me let me do this around. Finish your point. Yeah, like ten there's seconds. There's this whole then section Brandon, in the middle yeah. that that you know families who care about um, housing affordability uh, jobs. Yeah. And they're they're being left out of the conversation mm -hmm. of the of the right and the left, and they're going to stay home. They're not. And the, being yes, left I, out I, of the I, conversation I totally of the agree. Left one second. Let me let Brandon That's in here, and then we'll true. let you go. I I totally That's agree with true. that because people are, are forgetting. Like at the end of the day as much as all of these things are super important, and they are, because they affect your everyday life. What affects your, your life the most is can you afford to pay your mortgage? Can mm -hmm. you afford to pay your rent? But the, do you have enough money to take the bus? Do you have enough money to put gas and in your car? Were and right now, right now, the same situation that the liberals are facing in Canada, the, the Democrats are facing in the states. I, Cost of living is at all time highs, and people are upset. And they're remembering four years ago, and I'm not saying I, I agree with going back York to four Times, years ago, but I am Paul saying Kruger four years ago, people were getting checks with Trump's signature on it, and they remember that, yeah. and they're like, he gave me a check, the, the, I was able to make my rent. Mar Mary, we can't, we can't minimize that. Hang on, you're trying to hold your thought for one second. Mary, Mary you've been trying but, but, to get in but, here. Me? Oh, I'm saying that I just read a piece in the, in the New York Times over the weekend that, um, that said that inflation has, is actually halved as it all But as nobody it is feels that. Too. If you want to buy a big TV or something like that, it will, the, 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 the inflation is down on that, where the yeah. price of money is going up as the Westons and the Sobies and I don't know what the American people of that are making billions of dollars, more profit than ever, uh, you know, that we're blaming it on affordability. And, uh, and what Joe Biden has actually done in the United States is brought inflation down. Yeah, but we have, to, we have to look at the stats. So, I mean, so, the, the housing prices in the states have gone up more than 40% from 2020 to 2023. Uh, so if you're looking, if you're a young millennial and so you're out of, you're out of university, and there's a housing you want to start crisis a family, you, you want to buy a home, United you can. Kingdom. A lot of them the can. There's a housing crisis in, in every history, Western democracy. This is the first time in America we've seen an actual growth of unity jobs under President Joe Biden. They say that the best anti-poverty policy is a unionized job. When we yes. look at what the left is actually proposing, these are actually anti-poverty. These are affordability issues. Healthcare is about affordability. Unionized jobs will help you have an affordable life. When we talk about the investments they're bringing in to make uh, you know, social services more available that is around affordability the right isn't talking about that the right They're is not. literally talking about conspiracy theories attacking lgbt communities and other vulnerable communities and talking literally about the, you know this cultural war my the, the position i'm putting forward is that the democrats actually are working to protect people's economic issues. But they got the messaging has to be more clear, it has to be more direct. But, but protecting right. a woman's right to choose is an economic perhaps. issue I as well. They're not very good at messaging, perhaps. I agree entirely. We were hey, supposed to agree on something. <laughs> we were supposed to talk about robots <laughs> and robot chefs making salads, but I guess we'll have I to got leave a, I got a whole bit on time. that, Trav. <laughs> oh, that's so fascinating. <laughs> that is a wrap for our intersection panel tonight with Brandon Gonez, founder of C and CEO of Gonez Media, comedian Mary Walsh and St. John's Gurtan Singh, former Ontario and NDP, MPP, and Vice President at Crestview Strategy, and Larissa Waller, uh, Principal at GTN Company and former Executive Director of Communications for Ontario Premier Doug Ford. We'll be back. So nice to speak.
shot 18-year-old Sammy Atim several times after he pulled out a knife on a streetcar in 2013. Forcillo was later convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to six years in jail. Now he is out on parole. Stephanie Skanderis is covering the inquest. So, Stephanie, uh, good evening to you. What did we learn today, and what did we hear from Forcillo this afternoon? Good evening, Travis. Well, James Forcillo has been questioned so far by lawyers from the inquest and also a little bit from the lawyers for Sammy Yatim's family. And one of the things that he was asked is what he thinks would have changed the course of that night 10 years ago now. And he said that if he'd had a taser instead of a gun, that would have, in his words, changed everything and he said none of us would be here today as in none of us would be here at this inquest. He said that at the time only frontline supervisors had access to tasers, something he called a giant failure, but he says now that's been remedied with more tasers available. He was also asked if he'd ever had de-escalation training, something that he said he couldn't recall, and he was also asked a lot of questions about past incidents involving use of force, about his conduct towards the public when he was in traffic enforcement, about how many times he had drawn his gun in the past. He'd actually been flagged for drawing his firearm six times in the year leading up to that night that he killed Sammy Yatim. One incident was just 10 days before that. Now he kind of brushed off a lot of those questions um, saying that he either didn't recall the incidents and he also said that working in traffic writing up tickets naturally ruffled feathers. Uh, that's what he said. But the point of this inquest is not to put Forcillo back on trial. He's already been convicted of attempted uh. murder. It's, uh, this inquest is mandatory under provincial law, but it's also to look at police decision making and police practices when dealing with people in crisis. This isn't it for Forcillo. He will appear at the inquest again tomorrow. Yeah, and, and as you know, that you, you talked about that, uh, the broader issue of police training, that is something that is greatly debated right now. Well, let's talk about who else we heard from in this inquest so far, Stephanie. Yeah, and that issue is kind of the overarching uh, piece to all of this, something that's really what's being looked at. So last week, the inquest heard from the officer who did use the taser on Sammy Yatim. He explained how he arrived on the scene. He said that he saw Yatim on the floor of the streetcar holding the knife, as he said, firmly in his grasp, and that he didn't obey commands to drop it. So uh, he also said that he learned Yatim had been shot a split second before he used the taser, so giving his point of view. The inquest has also heard from the streetcar operator, other police officers, and then in the vein that we're talking about police responses, uh, today it heard from a witness who is an expert on police behavior and stress responses. Now, all of this is an effort to make sure this doesn't happen again, and the jury in this inquest can make recommendations when it's over to prevent future deaths. Okay, Stephanie, appreciate it. Thank you. Well, after a short break, we'll be back on Canada Tonight with part two of our Spotlight interview with Rosalie Abella. And we'll have a preview of our Spotlight on recent Canada Walk of Fame inductee Tantu Cardinal. Plus, the story of a Ukrainian refugee who's giving back to her new home in Newfoundland, one clock at a time. That's coming up here on Canada Tonight.
last hour with her thoughts on the recent rise of anti-Semitism globally. There is um, a disproportionate assault on the only Jewish state in the world. So that, along with the rise of anti-Semitism, is very terrifying for somebody like me who came from people who survived the Holocaust. Also concerning to her the level of political discourse right now. She says more than ever, people seem to be in silos. Well, I think what we've stopped doing is listen to each other. We used to actually pay attention to what the other side was saying. We were committed to discourse and dialogues and conversations and trying to figure out why people were unhappy and what they were unhappy with in, in the public policy world. And the public interest was always the most important goal. What is best for the public? I don't know that there is any clear line anymore of what's in the public interest. And that's worrying because you need to be you need to be on a trajectory towards a goal, and I think Canada has been. But are you concerned that even within Canada, that dialogue that you're talking about is not happening? I think we're a lot better than most countries, sure. and I think we have a lot that we've got to be proud of in this country. I don't think we're nearly as fragmented as other countries are, mm -hmm. other countries that are very close to us, uh, but I think we have caught the um, can we say the fumes coming from the United States and the uh, insensitivity sometimes and the intolerance that has walked it up? Do you think that's Donald Trump's fault? I think, you know, there's no plexiglass separating our two countries, so we're always affected by what goes on in the United States. That is why, she says, what happens in this election year is so crucial for the United States, Canada, and the world. We know what the agenda is of um, one group on the political spectrum, and it's not inclusive, it's not uh, rights sensitive. And I think the big triumph of what we did after World War II was focus on the protection of rights. And we've lost some, we seem to have lost interest in that as the mainstream ideology, but not in Canada yet. But I am really worried about the culture that cancels, the culture that screams and yells, the culture that that hates, the culture that um, they won't listen, and, and that ignores history. Worry she now conveys to a new generation of up-and-coming lawyers at Harvard, where she is a visiting professor. 77, Abella looks back at her career with humility, a career filled with firsts and breaking down barriers. I was always determined to do my best wherever I went and just keep my fingers crossed that it would work out. What a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Great to talk to you too. Thanks. Coming up tomorrow on the Canada Tonight Spotlight. Now in her 70s, Canadian actress Tantu Cardinal is at the top of her game in Hollywood and here at home with a new star on Canada's Walk of Fame. From Marvel to Killers of the Flower Moon, she sits down to talk about her incredible career. Plus, she weighs in on the revelations around former friend Buffy St. Marie. I loathe these people. I want them to go to their own history and to their own culture, to their own ancestors, and go there. Our spotlight is on Tantu Cardinal tomorrow only on Canada Tonight. Well, a couple of newcomers to a Newfoundland town are marking, marking their, making their mark, that is, on their community. The town uh, clock had been out of commission for decades, but thanks to a Ukrainian watchmaker, those hands of time are ticking once again. Peter Cowan introduces us to the woman of the hour. People here in Carboneer don't remember exactly when the clock in the old post office stopped working, but it was sometime in the 1980s. Since then, various people have tried to fix it, to get it running again, but no one's been able to, at least until Ludmila Pass showed up. She's from Ukraine, and in November she arrived in Newfoundland to be reunited with her daughter. She has 52 years of experience as a clockmaker, so she agreed to climb up to the tower to see what she could do. 
they they took away all the rust also there was a problem because it's uh, very close to the ocean and lots of salt and dirt during many years became like a stones inside of the uh, details uh, and so they cleaned it they adjusted and it's, it's, it's running yeah for people here in Carbonear, it's brought a smile to their face to see the old clock up and working again. The town's deputy mayor says it may seem like a small thing, but it has a big impact. To know that, uh, you know, something that was still for so long uh, could be fixed, <clears throat> did get fixed, and uh, I was so excited about it. I, I couldn't thank uh, uh, Julia and her parents enough for... Uh, for what they've done for the town of Carbonera, and it fell right in around Christmas time. So I guess you might say there's a little bit of a Christmas miracle. The clock is working, but the work for Ludmila Pass isn't over. Now that people have heard about her skills, they're bringing her old cuckoo clocks and grandfather clocks that haven't run in years, hoping she can help. She says she's happy to help the people who've helped take her in. Peter Cowan, CBC News, Carbonera, Newfoundland. It's not great. Well, that is it for us here on Canada Tonight. Thank you so much for watching. The National is next with our chief correspondent, Adrian Arsenault, who speaks with a Canadian surgeon who spent a week in Gaza providing care. That's coming up. Stay with us here on CBC News Network.